For part two of our Max for Life best practices series, we're going to run you through some important guidelines for making the best Max for Life device you can so that both you and others can enjoy it to its fullest potential. We will run you through suggestions for a consistent and flexible device UI. This is also about how the device communicates itself in order for it to appear professional. We recommend making sure that your device works with all of Live 10 color themes. One benefit of supporting Live themes is that it can also save time in development because live.objects and their various states link to them by default. Consider that making your device look like a native live device also helps provide users with a consistent experience in live. If you choose not to follow live's themes, be mindful of the fact that there are some cases in which it may impair legibility, i.e. certain UI elements being visible in some themes but not others. Notice for example in this screenshot that black text changes to white when darker themes are used. In Max 8, device colors can be adjusted to current live themes with the live.colors object. Check out the live.colors help patcher for more information on how to use it. You can check that this has been correctly implemented by loading the device, opening the look and feel tab in live's preferences, and cycling through the selection of all four Live 10 themes Light, Mid Light, Mid Dark, and Dark. There is a legacy Live 9 theme that works with the Live.Colors object as well. Ableton Sans is included as a standard font in Max. It can be included from the inspector for any text based object parameter i.e. a comment or a live.dial label. Use this typeface for a look that is consistent with Live's devices. Live's device view has a fixed height, which can increase the inconvenience of horizontal scrolling. You can accommodate for this by reducing the width of each device as much as possible. One way to judge whether the width of your device is potentially problematic or not is to compare it to the functionality of similar existing devices. For example, is your Max for Live device a synth that includes a lot of features and parameters? If so, you can have a large device width similar to Poly from the Creative Extensions Live 10 pack. Is your device a utility? then it might make sense for it to be more narrow, similar to the LFO from the Live 10 core library. If you have a complex audio effect, you could use the width of the Convolution Reverb Pro as a reference. If you find that your device takes up too much horizontal space to your liking, there are several ways to reduce its width. Foldout view, allows you to set the device width dynamically by clicking an arrow button. This works particularly well by separating the main device parameters from other device configurations. For example, Surround Panner from the Surround Panner Live 10 pack provides the option to fold or unfold the I.O. configuration section. Tabbed View Create several tabs in order to reuse the same area in the device multiple times. This can be useful when your device has a large number of parameters that can be grouped into individual categories that don't need to be visually present all at once. For example, Convolution Reverb Pro integrates tabs into its design to show different pages that include EQ, panning, and modulation. Overlay view, this refers to a button that toggles an overlay view over the entire device. This can be a useful way to introduce an advanced parameters section. A good example is the LFO from the Live 10 Core Library. It has a button in the top right corner of the device that toggles its multi-map options as an overlay. For each of these cited example devices, you can open the Max for Live editor to see how these were implemented and you can go ahead and use that max code 
in your own device. There are several settings in the object inspector that we recommend checking out for the best use of the live.ui objects. For the presentation rectangle setting, make sure that the widgets are sized in whole pixels to avoid blurry shapes on non-retina screens. By using numbers like 4 instead of 4.3222 etc, repositioning objects with a click drag often results in these decimal point numbers, so be sure to check the inspector for object dimensions and positions in presentation mode. Use the LCD mode for the display style in the live.tab, live.numbox and live.text objects. This was designed to mirror Live's UI parameters. This ensures that pixels snap to the pixel grid on non-retina screens. This display style is not selected by default. Make sure that mouse up in the behavior section is selected as the output mode for live.text since it will match live's native button behavior. Also note that this output mode is not selected by default. Here's how to avoid common device performance pitfalls and bugs that makes for a device that is reliable in performance. For everyone to be able to use your device, it should work on both Mac and PC, so that a live set using the Max device is cross-compatible. Please note that third-party Max external objects that are not included in the standard Max distribution need to be compiled separately for Mac and PC platforms by their developers. We'll go into more detail on this in part 3. It is recommended to try to minimize the output to the Max console window as much as possible. Output of the Max console during development is vital for debugging. However, seeing errors and other messages in the console for other users can make your Max for Live device seem untrustworthy. Open the AMXD file in Live and right click on the device's title bar and choose Open Max Window to check for any error messages being printed to the console. To be safe, you can also double check on a different computer. Some Max for Live devices that use internal modulations may create a very large number of undo events. This renders your live undo function useless as a result and can be very frustrating as a user. This happens when a live parameter object like live.dial has its parameter visibility attribute set to automated and stored which is default or stored only and is then controlled internally by the patch like this. Your device will now be sending a constant stream of the same undo action to live. Any other action you perform in the program cannot be undone because it is instantly buried by the constant stream of the undo actions. To check this, load your device, enable any modulations and start live's playback. Perform an action in live to create an undo event. For example, make a new MIDI track. While live is running, check that the edit menu shows undo insert MIDI track as the last undo entry. If you need to implement modulation in this way, you will need to change in the inspector the parameter visibility setting to be hidden. Frozen tracks with a Max for Live device should preferably sound the same as unfrozen playback. If this isn't the case, then you may experience an issue in which the live set sounds different on playback than when you rendered the track as an audio file. To check this, load your Max for Live device into track 1 and create a simple clip. Create an audio track 2 and route the audio from track 1 into track 2. Play the clip in track 1 and record the audio into track 2. Finally, freeze track 1 and play back track 1 and track 2 and compare the output of both tracks. 
Ideally, these should be the same. Max for Live allows setting defined latency in the patch inspector. Live compensates for this latency on playback. To make sure that your device plays in sync with the rest of the live set, it may be required to set the correct device latency. To check your device latency in live, load your Max for Live device and then hover your mouse over the device title bar. The device latency amount will be displayed in the live status bar. Max for Live device performance should be measured in a live set within a musical context if possible to avoid unwanted CPU meter spikes. Check this by loading several instances of your device in a live set. Add some other Max for Live devices or live instruments and automate some parameters in your Max for Live device. If parameter automation causes high CPU load, try enabling defer automation output in the object inspector or try higher values for the update limit. Live treats Max for Live devices in a similar way as sample files. Live sets reference a Max for Live device meaning the device is not contained within the live set. If you create a live set with a specific device and later change that device, the live set may not play back correctly. To assure that a live set always plays back correctly, be sure to freeze your Max for Live device. Live stores parameter values for each live.parameter that is set to automated and stored or stored only. Live identifies the live.parameter in a Max for Live device by its long name. Therefore, avoid changing the long name of any live.object when updating the device since this will break the parameter value recall. If you do make significant changes to your device, we would recommend publishing a new AMXD with a different file name. In most cases, this is done by appending a version number to the file name. You may want to distribute a new frozen version of your device regularly. However, when continuing to work on your device, it is recommended not to continue with the frozen one, but to continue with the original version. This is because when you unfreeze your Max for Live device to continue editing it, a new copy of its dependencies will be stored in a folder on your hard drive. This can cause confusion, different dependencies, and ultimately end up breaking your Max for Live device. A good rule could be to always remove the frozen version of your Max for Live device from your system after distribution. When working on multiple Max for Live devices and providing regular incremental updates, you may want to consider keeping the original versions of your plugins and their dependencies in a version control system like GitHub. Note that using GitHub requires careful study and we will not cover that in this document.